the next part of our thinking as revolutionaries is how are we going to change this? And who do we have to go on that journey with? Who needs to be in leadership of that struggle? And how do we combat what the opposition, in this case the ruling class, is doing to control people's minds and have them not think in an independent manner about what's going on in this country? How they feed them on a daily basis with the concept that they are the problem. How they feed them on a daily basis to point fingers at somebody else because they might not look like them or speak like them or were born on the same land that they were born in. So we have to look at those things. Now, the, let's take the public sector. Um, I'm a public sector worker. Christine is a, and I hope she contributes and other people in this room might be public sector workers or retired public sector workers. When we were growing up, the saying was, get yourself a good government job. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and why did our parents and neighbors tell us that? There was a, several reasons. One, that the civil service system was set up to sort of uh, level the playing field. So if you took a test and you passed, you got on the list. Nobody knew what color you were or what gender you were right. or where you grew up. And you were called from that list. Now, that's not saying that there wasn't racism in the city and the, and the state and the federal government at all. Because usually, because of the education system, I know when I lived in D.C., blacks, for the most part, would, as, as the lowest tier in the whole uh, system of federal employment. They were still relegated to the lowest pay, paid jobs. And that's pretty much the same here in the city. But on the other hand, it did open a way for people to get jobs where they could actually feed their families, they could actually pay their rent or buy a house, and they actually could send their children to school. Um, now, and the majority of the people that are public sector workers throughout the, throughout the country, but particularly <coughs> looking since we're here in New York, are people of color and women. Uh, and those are the women, and that's the, not putting a face on what's happening. I think that's another part of the educational process. We can't just talk about stats. We have to actually put in front of everybody who is it that's being impacted by all these cuts, by all these lies about these greedy workers. When you look at the average salary of workers in DC 37, it's not the 100,000 and 250,000 that Bloomberg's people make who are supposed to be city employees. That's the average salary of Bloomberg staff. The average salary of the commissioners is $250,000. No city worker in DC 37 makes that kind of money in, in any of the locals whatsoever. In terms of the pensions, they lie is that people are taking off big, you know, bags of gold and going off on their retirement and they could go buy an island and live there. <laughs> Any worker who's worked for the city, who's retired, know that that's not true. And they'd be lucky if it lasts a couple of years in their retirement to be able to pay for anything. So we have to look at what's being said and who's saying it and why they're saying it. I, I always like what uh, uh, Malcolm always talks about, that part of our first task in struggling is to look at where the chains have to be removed, and they have to be removed from our minds. So you have, uh, one of the, the problems is that we have unions, the unions are under attack, they're losing their members, but the unions aren't leadership, are not doing sufficient fight back to help raise the class consciousness of their members and a sense of independence. They have one hand chained behind them, and the other hand they're putting it up in the fist, but the hand is empty because it has no power. Why does it not have power? Because it's not united with other workers? Why does it not have power? Because they betrayed their own members by letting them take what? We're at tier uh, six now in DC 37. What is this? How did we get to tier six? It didn't happen by osmosis. It happened because the workers weren't sufficiently organized to fight against this. They were not involved in direct action, direct action that educates the class to be united, direct action that is clear who your enemy is and where you're pointing your anger and your organized effort to. That does not happen. If you have everything sort of, I'm going to do a white paper, and I have some summaries of the white paper from DC 37. The white papers are good from the standpoint that it describes the problem, it talks about outsourcing, it talks about how much money is wasted. 
but okay, you have that paper, but do you have also a paper on the history of resistance of workers and how they were able to organize themselves and successfully fight back to even get a union in the first place, to fight against um, concessionary contracts, to organize a strike? Do they even know about the general strikes that even happened in this period? Do they know about the Republic workers, you know, in the Midwest? Do they know about Guadalupe and Martinique? Where they, they not just talked about, oh, I want five cents more on my salary. They talked about the racism and the fact that they were still colonies and under the French. So where is that information? Because you just tell me about the tier, and you're telling me that I don't want the tier because I'm going to be, or the new people that are coming are going to be making less money. But what you're not saying is what happens to me, I'm in the first tier. And him, he's in the sixth tier, but we're in the same union paying the same dues. What kind of attitude will he have towards the union and what kind of attitude will he has me? The way the education process is within the unions, it creates divisions and perpetuates them. So it aids and abets its own oppressor against themselves. So instead of saying, no, I remember we were negotiating contract the last time I was involved in negotiating contract directly, we went in and saying, we fought the tears tooth and nail. And we said, we, this, is one of, this is gonna be demand number one, no tears. No tears whatsoever. And instead, the manager said, yes, I agree with you. We don't want any tears either. We want one tier. We want the lowest tier. So that, and we put that information out. That was the best education for the people on the team who had never sat that close and listened to management's verbiage. It really su sunk into them what that meant. And we said your selfishness to the workers of saying I'm not going to join the fight against the tier system because those are for people that are not even here. I have to right. safeguard myself. Yeah. What happened? Those very same people were the ones that weren't there because what was management's view? Management's strategy was I want a tier, but I want the lowest tier, so I'm going to get rid of you. I'll be motivated to get rid of the highest paid worker with the most vacation, the highest benefits and stuff, and replace them with the ones that you didn't care about. So there's a whole need for us to talk about how do we organize and what do we say to people and how do we train you know, uh, uh, workers who are actually already count conscious on one level that they know they have to fight back, they know they have to organize and they're fearless, but they might not have all the information to take back to the other workers about what is the alternative than going to the table with our tail between our legs and coming out talking about going on strike, but we know that we haven't prepared people to go on strike. Not only the people that are on strike, but for the public sector, you're also talking about the public. Have you prepared them to support you while you're going to go on strike. So when the UPS workers went on strike, everybody knew a UPS worker. And so therefore there was a basis for some kind of sympathy and support. Wouldn't it have been a greater consciousness if the UPS workers also put out more information about what was happening to them and how that could impact their communities? Wouldn't it have been greater for them when TWU went on strike around Christmas time to get out more information about what does what this attack on us, what is it going to mean to the rest of you all? If you all don't take a stand with us, what is it going to mean? Because now today, you're seeing what it means. Now today, you're experiencing what it means. But there were people that were saying, oh, I have several family members that are in TWU, and they make too much money. Hmm. They make more than me. Are you in a unionized place? No. Why don't you organize your place so you can make more money like they're doing, which is not a hell of a lot of money, and then you would be in unity with them, protecting that. But instead, we have this kind of bunker mentality that's been perpetuated by the leadership, unfortunately, too many of the leaders of the union. 